Welcome to lecture 11 on surface integrals. The title is Integrals of Vector Functions, Construction of the Surface Integral. So we've gotten to the point now where we're going to talk about surface integrals. In last lecture we talked about vector valued functions and how you can construct them. And now we want to calculate integrals of vector valued functions. Now we have two choices. We either are going to construct an integral where we where we are integrating each component of the vector valued function so that each component looks like a scalar or we have to have a way of converting that vector valued function into a scalar which then can become the argument of an integral that we then integrate with the normal techniques that we know how to integrate an integral and the traditional way to make scalars from vectors is with the dot product so to integrate over a surface, we've seen this before, we need to divide the surface into patches and sum up the contributions of each of those patches, the area associated with each patch. But now what we're going to do is we're going to associate a vector with each surface patch, and that vector is going to be pointing normal to the surface, and its magnitude is going to be equal to the area of the small surface patch. So as that small surface patch changes slightly in area from one location to another, that normal vector will change its magnitude, and the direction will always be pointing in the outward normal direction. Now we have a vector function, which is also defined in all space. So there's a vector function defined at each location where we have one of these normal vectors. What we do is we take the dot product of that vector-valued function with this unit not unit, but with this normal vector, and that measures something that you could loosely describe as how the function flows through the surface. And the technical term for this is something called flux, which you probably heard of in electricity and magnetism. It was related to how the field lines are flowing out from a charge or flowing into a charge, depending upon whether it was positive or it was negative. So we have to construct the normal to the surface. Now the book goes through the derivation of this, but I want to go through it again for you as well. Uh, the first question that you would ask is, well, how do I construct the normal to, the, to a surface? Let's assume our surface is described by a function so that our surface, our 3D object we're looking at is x, y, f of x, y then the way that we find the normal to the surface at any given point is we find two tangent vectors to the surface. Since it's a surface, it's two-dimensional, there are two tangent vectors corresponding to the plane that describes the function at that point most accurately. And so how do I get the perpendicular of two vectors? I take their cross product. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the two tangent vectors, we're going to take their cross product, and then we're going to normalize the cross product, and that will give us the unit normal vector. Okay, so we have to take a derivative in the x direction, that'll give us one of the tangent vectors, and the derivative in the y direction will give us the other tangent vector. So our first tangent vector is just the derivative of the, sur the equation for the surface, and when I take d by dx of x, I get 1, d by dx of y gives 0, and df by dx is left in the third component. And similarly, when I take the second tangent vector, I get 0, 1, df by dy. And now I have to take the cross product of these two. And so by looking at the cross product, let's look at the individual terms in each of the vectors to determine what that cross product is. I start with t1. It has a 1 in the x direction. When I cross that with the 1 in the y direction from t2, I will get a 1 in the z direction. When I take the 1 in the x direction and cross it with the df dy in the z direction, I will get a minus df dy in the y direction, because x cross z is equal to minus y in terms of the unit vectors. Finally, I have a df dx when I cross in the z direction from the first tangent vector. When I cross that with the y, I will get a minus x, and so I'll get a minus df dx in the x position of the vector. And finally, I have a df dx crossed into a df dy. That's a z cross z, but z cross z is equal to zero, so that term doesn't give me anything. So I find the unit normal is in the direction 
minus df dx for the x component, minus df dy for the y component, and 1 for the z component. Now I have to make it a unit vector. How do I do that? I just divide by the length of that vector. So I multiply by 1 over the square root of 1 plus df dx squared plus df dy squared. Now if this looks a little reminiscent to what we were doing with arc lengths, it is. But we have two terms here because we have two directions in which we see areas and so it's a little bit more complicated than just the arc length formula was. All right, how do we construct the integral? To construct the integral, what we have to do is we have to break the surface up into those little patches. We have to associate the normal vector with each of, each of those patches. We have to take the dot product of the normal vector with the vector field and then we have to sum that up over all possible patches. So I've illustrated for you on the left what this procedure is. The red dot is the location xi, yi, zi. The blue rectangle is the patch on the surface area that we'll call delta si. The normal vector is in the direction n hat with the blue arrow. And the vector field is in the direction given by f, which is the green arrow. What I would do is I would take the dot product of that blue arrow with the green arrow. That's a number then. I take that number, I'd multiply it by the delta si, and then I sum it over all the patches. And that's all it takes to do the integral. So it really is not incredibly complicated. There's nothing inherently difficult about this. But what I find, often students forget how to construct this and if you forget what it is you're supposed to do or you leave out a step, then you're bound to get incredibly confused. So please take a moment to carefully look at and understand exactly how the surface integral is constructed. All right, I always find when we have something complicated, it's nice to do an example. So we're going to look at computing the surface area of a hemisphere that has a radius r. And we're going to look at the area both of the spherical, hemispherical cap in the uh, upper part, and we're also going to look at the area of the bottom cap, the planar bottom cap of the hemisphere as well. Now, the unit normals in the hemispherical direction are in the radial direction, so their angles and their directions will change depending upon where I sit on the hemisphere. On the other hand, the unit normal, the outward pointing normal to the cap at the bottom, is always in the minus z direction. It's always pointing down. So we don't have to continually recompute that unit normal vector. So how do I get the area? Now I'm going to use a trick. I'm going to pick the function f is equal to n hat. Why would I do that? Because n hat dot n hat is equal to 1. It's a unit vector. So since it's a unit vector, it drops out of the calculation. And all I'm doing now is just integrating 1 over the area and over the differential area. And that, of course, is going to give me the total area. So let's look at that differential area. First, we start with the hemispherical cap. We are going to get a factor of r squared. And then we have a d cosine theta d phi. If you remember, that's the area units or the area measure when we're working in spherical coordinates and we're integrating over a sphere. Now we have to look at the limits. Well, the phi is going all the way around the sphere, so that's going 0 to 2 pi. I'm going all the way around the z-axis. But d cosine theta is only going from 0 to 1. And that's because when I'm pointing in the positive z direction, cosine theta is 1. And by the time I get down to the equator, the cosine theta is equal to 0. But I have nothing below the equator, so none of the negative values of cosine theta enter. Now let's look at the second piece of the integral. That's the bottom cap of the hemisphere, the planar cap. And we're going to use polar coordinates there. We have an integral from 0 to 2 pi for the polar angle. And then we have an integral of dr times r for the radius. And that goes from 0 to, to r, whereas the polar angle goes from 0 to 2 pi. Integrating that last integral, well, the integral over phi is going to give me 2 pi. The integral over r is going to give me an r squared over 2, which when I evaluate it with the big R is going to give me big R squared over 2. I multiply that by 2 pi. My net result is pi big R squared, which of course is the radius of that circle. And when I look at the hemisphere, the integral from 0 to 2 pi d phi, that's going to just be 2 pi. The integral from 0 to 1 d cosine theta, that's just equal to 1. So I'm going to get 2 pi r squared. And when I sum all of them together, I get 3 pi r squared. 
Now, of course, we know the integral of a hemisphere top is 2 pi r squared because the integral of a whole sphere is 4 pi r squared. And the hemisphere is just half of the integral of the full sphere. All right, that wasn't that hard of an example to do because we washed under the rug ever having to determine the normal because we took the vector field to be equal to the normal and n squared was equal to 1 everywhere regardless of where I was. We're going to now look at a tougher example. We're going to still do an integral over that same hemisphere, but we're going to change what the function is that we're going to be integrating. So that vector valued function f is now going to be different. What we're going to do is we're going to pick an f that is equal to x times the unit vector in the x direction. And when I write that in polar coordinates, it's going to be big R sine theta cosine phi times i hat, i hat being the unit vector in the x direction. And so now we plug this into our integral. In order to do that, we have to first determine what is the unit normal. And the radial direction, a unit vector in the radial direction, is x i hat plus y j hat plus z k hat divided by the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. When I'm on the surface of the hemisphere, x squared plus y squared plus z squared is just equal to r squared. So its square root is just equal to r. If I plug in the values for x, y, and z in spherical coordinates, I'm going to see that the r is going to cancel numerator and denominator. And I'm going to be left with sine theta cosine phi i hat plus sine theta sine phi j hat plus cosine the theta k hat. That's for the hemispherical cap. What about for the bottom planar or circular cap? For the bottom planar cap, it's just equal to the minus k hat. It's in the minus z direction and it never changes. So now we can look at the dot product of f dot n. f dot n is only going to pick up the i hat component and it's going to equal r times sine squared theta cosine squared phi on the hemisphere and it's going to equal zero on the cap because f is in the x direction and n is pointing in the z direction when I'm on the cap. So our integral, we're going to only get the first part over the hemisphere to have a non-zero value. The integral over the second part is multiplied by zero, so that's not going to contribute. And the integrand is going to just be this n dot f, which is r sine squared theta cosine squared phi. So now I have to do an integral. I can pull the factors of r out. And I can do the integral over phi. The integral of cosine squared, when I integrate over a period, is just equal to a half times the range over the angle. So that's going to just equal pi. And the integral over cosine theta, I have to work a little bit on. I'm going to convert the sine squared theta into 1 minus cosine squared theta. So the integral d cosine theta of 1, that's just equal to cosine theta. And when I evaluate that between 0 and 1, I just get a 1. The integral of cosine squared theta, that's going to be equal to 1 third cosine cubed theta. Once again, evaluated between 0 and 1. So that's going to be a 1 third, but it has a minus sign in front of it. So I get 1 minus 1 third, which is 2 thirds. And so the net effect is it's going to be. 2 pi over 3, I'm sorry, it should be r cubed instead of r squared. That's a typo. So the final answer should be 2 pi over 3 r cubed. All right, now we're going to talk about some of the technical details of exactly how we perform integrals. If you remember back to what we did when we were doing arc lengths, we actually didn't want to integrate ds along the arc of the curve, but rather we wanted to integrate over dx or dy because that was a much more controllable variable that we could integrate over. Similarly here, we don't want to integrate over ds because that changes from one patch to another. We'd rather integrate over dx dy, but that means we have to find the way to convert from the area ds to the area dx dy. And to do this, we have to work out some geometry. There's a figure that is given for you here that shows us exactly how we have to do it. So we have on the left hand side, we have our curved patch where our dss are. We project them onto the plane to get our dx and dy. And now if I look at one of those patches, which is now in this central plot, what I see is that ds is going to be at some angle relative to the plane. And depending upon what that angle is, that angle is going to mean that the rectangle that represents the ds is going to be slightly bigger than we thought it was. It's indeed going to be equal to dx times dy divided by the cosine of theta. 
Well, what's the cosine of theta? Well, if I look at what that unit normal is, it's going to be the unit normal dotted into the unit vector in the z direction, or k hat. So cosine theta is just n dot k. And so the conversion between ds and dx dy is going to be n dot k. Now, to actually calculate this for an integral, I got to remind myself what was n equal to. And if I remember what the kth component of n was, it was just a 1. And so I get a 1 times a 1, which is a 1. But then I have to divide by that normalization factor, which is the square root of 1 plus df dx squared plus df dy squared. So that's n dot k. I'm going to be dividing by n dot k, which means that denominator is going to go into the numerator. And so now when I work out what the integral is, it's going to still have the integrand, which is f dot n. But the ds is going to be changed to a dx dy times the square root of 1 plus df dx squared plus df dy squared. And I still have the f dot n present. If you recall, this looks just like what we had when we were looking at an arc length. It, it is very, very similar to the procedure that we did to convert the integral over ds for an arc length to an integral over dx or over dy. And indeed, the reason why it comes out that way is because that's the way that this geometry works, except now I have to do it in the two separate directions. And that's where we get this more complicated square root that we have to deal with. So these are things that you really need to remember. You need to remember exactly how to do this. And then if you do that, surface integrals, you'll find, will not be something that you need to be afraid of. But they'll be something that you should be able to work out as long as you're careful and work slowly and make sure you go through all of the steps and you don't forget anything.